This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Good morning. It is Saturday, the 29th of April, 2023, and I have a video. Uh, I have an interview, I'm sorry, with my friend Patrick, who is going to talk to us about what it is to be a trainee teacher in the current climate. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Yes, good morning. We are back. It seems like a very long time since we have had breakfast together. Um, Between taking a little break for the Easter weekend and um, then the technical difficulties that have plagued the show over the last couple of weeks, I was beginning to think that, uh, that we would never be together again. And yet here we are. Oh, Jonah has texted in. Good morning to you, Jonah. It's lovely to have you listening in this morning. I've got a very exciting show for you today um, because we have an interview. Um, As you know, interviews are quite rare here on Saturday morning breakfast, mostly because I feel like they're cursed. It seems to be every time I try to do an interview show, something goes wrong. And so it is just um, much less cursed if I sit here and chat with you. But we do like to have voices. We do like to have diverse voices on the show, which is why I have a pre-recorded interview this morning with my friend and colleague, Patrick, who is a trainee teacher. Um, He is in the classroom for the first year and he's going to talk to us um, in about 10 minutes about his teaching philosophy, about what it is to be a trainee teacher at the moment and about how he sees his teaching career going forward. Tim has also texted in good morning to you, Tim. Great to have you back. Not as great as it is to be back. I will be very honest. My Saturday mornings, and I've said this before when I've missed shows, my Saturday mornings are not the same. Um, without being here with you all. And, you know, as I'm sure many of you, particularly those of you who are in the teaching space um, on Twitter, will know we quite often on Teachers Talk Radio, when we are advertising for new hosts, when we've got a, a show slot that we would like somebody to take over, we say that this is really, really good CPD. Um, and it is. It's, I I think I have learned so much in preparing for each show because, just because of the sheer quantity of shows that we do, obviously just talking about our own specialisms is never going to be enough. And so we've got to do research, we've got to take on other people's voices. And I've learned so much by prepping my shows. And so I love doing them for, for exactly that reason. Oh, it is Jonah's birthday. Happy birthday to you, Jonah. I hope you have a great day. Um, I hope you are able to celebrate. I don't know where in the world you are, um, but here in England, it is at least a very sunny start to your birthday. And I hope that uh, that is going to be a a good omen for you. It is the end of my first week back at school. Um, My school started back on Monday and I must say it has been such a long week, ever such a long week. I must not complain and I will not complain because as a teacher, I understand that I am blessed with the understanding that every six or seven weeks, I will have a week off. Um, And I know that not everybody gets that. I know that most other jobs, you go much, much longer in between vacation times. and, And I never take that for granted. But it has been a very, very long week. And um, I am already counting down (laughs) to half term. So it was good, though. It was good to be back at school. It was quite interesting. I spoke to um, 
many of my colleagues I spoke to, many of my kids about it, and they were all saying about how needed that Easter holiday was. I think there was something about last half term, about that stretch from February through to the beginning of April that seemed to wipe a lot of people out. And so, you know, yes, I am lucky that I have these holidays. And as teachers, we are lucky that we have the holidays. Um, but we must also keep in mind, actually, the necessity of them, that our young people are quite often exhausted by the time we get to those holidays every six or seven weeks, just as we are exhausted from the um, the the ridiculous number of hours that we work. And so, you know, it is a blessing to have the holidays. We are lucky to have the holidays, but they are also for us very, very necessary. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. ASCOL is due to ballot members for the first time in its history. The four education unions will ballot over strike action this term and, if backed by members, would see action stretching into next year and could lead to full school closures. The government continues to hold its position that the most recent pay offer is fair and reasonable and that next year school funding will be at its highest level in history. Schools Week covers the further implications of school funding issues in a story about the cuts some head teachers are making. In a survey conducted by the National Foundation for Education Research for the Sutton Trust, it was found that schools are cutting back on school trips, teaching assistance and IT equipment to help balance stretch budgets. Responses from 1,428 primary and secondary teachers show 50% of senior leaders said their school had cut back on trips and outings this year. Schools in the most disadvantaged areas were most likely to be impacted by cuts to trips. The research suggests that in secondary schools, leaders are also cutting back on subject choices at both GCSE and A level. The Department for Education has estimated schools overall could afford 2.4 billion in new spending between 2022 and 2024 before facing net pressure on their budgets. But the Confederation of School Trusts warned its members could face a prolonged period of financial challenge due to pay rises and other increasing costs if more funding was not forthcoming. The Sutton Trust's poll also showed that some school leaders are using pupil premium funding to plug budget gaps. The report also underlines the issue of recruitment into the sector, with the NFER predicting that the DfE will again miss its recruitment into initial teacher training target this year. Meanwhile, the TES focused on a DfE funding rule change to help schools hit by falling pupil numbers due to a decline in birth rate. Schools that are not rated good or outstanding will be eligible for additional funding. Other changes will be introduced from 2024 to 25, and councils will set expectations around the minimum funding they must provide to support schools with significant increases in pupil numbers. Schools with more than one site will also receive extra funding where they need to duplicate services over multiple sites. Falling birth rates mean there are projected to be half a million fewer pupils in English state nurseries and primaries in 2028, compared with 2022. Nurseryworld.co.uk reports on the findings of its recent survey into staff wellbeing around Ofsted inspections. In the article on its website, it reports that over 3,000 owners, managers and staff responded to questions around mental health and wellbeing and the impact of inspections. Many responded that they felt increased stress and anxiety in the run-up to an inspection, with many having sleepless nights and some suffering from panic attacks and depression. The possibility of losing funding, should a setting be judged inadequate, was also mentioned. Full details of the survey can be found on the Nursery World website. The Guardian reports that a record figure of £4.8 billion interest has been added to student debt in Britain last year. The government has more than doubled the amount of money it makes from charging interest on student loans as graduates face borrowing costs of almost twice the rate set by the Bank of England. The Office for National Statistics said the accrued interest had doubled from £2.3 billion in the previous year. The forecast average debt among the cohort of students who started their course in 2021 and 22 
is £45,800 when they complete their course. Finally, the Morning Star in Scotland reports that increased spending per school pupil is failing to deliver improved outcomes. Spending per pupil has risen to £8,500 in Scotland, compared with around 7200 across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. But attainment in Scotland is not on a similarly rising trajectory. Research by the Institute for Fiscal Studies shows that despite having the highest spending per pupil across the UK for a long period, test scores in reading, maths and science have either stayed the same or have been going down. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm going to attempt to explain in simple terms how the internet works. Let's take this tech briefing for example. I know every single one of you at some point have thought, how on earth can someone who makes a recording in one part of the world be broadcast globally to thousands of people and there'll be very few errors? I won't even go off when you go under a bridge. Although, I did give Tom Rogers a lift once and can tell you he's so radio he stopped talking when I drove through the Mersey Tunnel. For the internet to work, a way of allowing people to simultaneously use the same cables had to be created. The traditional phone call method could not be used because this would limit the number of users. If computers made a dedicated connection like a phone call does, then there'd be a lot of waiting going on. Imagine if you had to wait in line for a download. You are 457th in the queue. Your download is important to us. Please listen to this monotonous music while you wait. It simply wouldn't catch on. So, what happens? Data is transmitted in a similar way to the postal system. Just a lot quicker. Right now, this podcast is arriving on your device in a series of packets. Packets are really small chunks of data that can be sent from device to device via routers. Without getting too geeky on you, the host server gets a request from you when you press play. The request says start sending me the packets of the audio chocolate you know as Steve Woods' tech briefing. And like chocolate, it's split into chunks. These chunks are given an address to get to, an address of where they came from, some other information like the type of file being sent so your device knows which application to open it in, and a number so the packets can be ordered and rebuilt when they arrive. These packets are directed over the internet by routers that use the address information to direct them and then rebuilt by your device once they arrive. Because packets are so small and can be forwarded rapidly, lots of computers can send data at the same time and keep everybody connected. So next time you're using the internet, consider that what you're looking at has probably been split into thousands of packets routed across the world and been rebuilt in a matter of milliseconds for you to enjoy. As always, if you have a tech question, why not send it to at TT Radio Official. I'm Steve Woods. And that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. I read once a philosophy paper about the the philosophical implications of teleportation, because I'm very sad and have no life. Um, and and the idea behind this this paper was that that teleportation as we see it in in science fiction shows the idea that you can be taken from one place and immediately moved somewhere else is is not actually feasible because what would happen is your body is physically broken down and then it is rebuilt elsewhere and this paper was all about the ethical implications of that you know if your body is broken down and then rebuilt somewhere else is it still you Or is it a facsimile of you? Is it a a, a copy for you? Um, That is a bit too much for my my brain to process at 9.13 in the morning when my coffee is still half full. But that was kind of what what Steve's Two Minute Tech reminded me of. The idea that, as far as I'm concerned, I'm sitting here in the studio talking to you and you are just kind of hearing my voice. But you're not really. You're hearing what I'm saying broken up into these little packets that are then being delivered to you. Um, So is it actually my voice that you are hearing or is it just a facsimile? But yeah, that's that's not a question for us to be answering at quarter past nine in the morning. The other thing that I did want to pick up on before we get into our interview is the sadness of the curriculum cuts. Um, Because as far as I'm concerned, quite frankly, my, my belief is that if a child wants to learn something, they should be able to learn it. Uh, Particularly if a child wants to learn something and the school that they attend has a teacher who is able to teach it. 
I think that child should have that opportunity to learn. I think one of the biggest disservices we do in in the British education system is limit what our children can learn based on the exams that they can take. And so to then hear that schools are having to cut GCSE and A-level options because of funding, further reducing what children are able to learn. I think that is what parents and the media should be focusing on. I think that is what should be causing the outrage. I think that is where the whole, we need to think of the children, we need to do what's best for the children needs to come into play. Um, I don't think that IO should be um, should be directed at the teachers who choose to strike. Um, I don't think it should be directed at the people who are trying to do what's best for the kids. It should be directed at the fact that so many children are missing out on learning opportunities just because schools do not have the funding to provide them. You know, I teach modern languages and I teach classics, which are traditionally not um, high in uptake in this country. I could do a whole show on why, and I might do at some point. Um, in fact, Patrick and I do touch on that a little bit in our interview uh, in a couple of minutes. But they will quite often, along with the arts, be the first subjects that are cut down. And I think that's very unfair if you have a child who wants to learn. I um, I actually wanted to be a dual linguist when I did my GCSEs. I wanted to do French and German, which were the two languages that my school offered. Um, the school couldn't fund that. It, um, it had to put the French and German GCSE classes on at the same time. Um, just you know, because of the funding that it had. And so theoretically, as a student, and as somebody who went on to become a linguist professionally, uh, I was I was being done a disservice. Now, fortunately, my school was very proactive. The head of languages at my school was very proactive. And she said, look, it's okay. What you can do is do one language on timetable. We will give you all the resources you need for the other one. And I will give up my time you know, an hour every so often, whenever you need it, teach yourself and let's just see what happens. And and so I did. Um, I taught myself GCSE German. But had I been in a school that, that wasn't so proactive and that didn't recognise uh, that I had potential in language, then I may not have been able to do that at all. And I may have had one of my my joyful subjects taken away from me, which is really, really sad. And I think if there is any interest in a school, um, in a subject, then that subject should be offered. I think if you've got an A-level Latin class of one, if you've got an A-level Biblical Hebrew class of one, then that class should still be able to be offered because it's what that one child wants to learn. But that's that's just my soapbox. But I did say that I wouldn't speak too much about it and I spent about three minutes on it. Um, so let's get down to the meat of today. I have a pre-recorded interview with my friend Patrick, who is a trainee teacher. So he was back in the classroom for the very first time in September. I wanted to get his thoughts on, initially I wanted to get his thoughts on what the teacher training process is like. Um, but it was very interesting as our conversation happened, just to hear his thoughts on his teaching philosophy as a new teacher, on the importance of MFL, he is an MFL teacher, um, to him, why he chose to go into MFL when we know that languages um, are not a, a, a widely cho chosen option and what he thinks his career looks like. Now, because this is a pre-recorded interview, I won't be able to take calls or to ask Patrick any questions live, but if you do have anything that you would like his opinion on, um, please do text in if you are listening live on the Podbean app, or feel free to tweet me. I am at Mr. D. Lester, M-R-D-L-E-S-T-E-R, all one word, um, and I will get any questions that you might have to Patrick, and I will be sure to respond to those. But for now, please do sit back and enjoy our interview. Patrick, good morning. I'm so glad to have you on the show today. Darren, thank you so much for having me on board. As in, uh, you know, I've been loving our conversations to date, and I love the work you've been doing. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity. 
Oh, thank you, Rose. Well, I'm grateful to you too because I've been thinking about this a lot since we since we set this up. Um, just for some context for the listeners, you and I met because um, you had put a social media post out asking for some help with a pedagogy that I've got very specific experience with. Um, and, and so we kind of chatted and we did kind of what you would expect the, the transactional um, conversation between a student teacher and an experienced teacher to be where um, we set up a meeting and I talked for like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, the idea there was that, that you were learning from, from my experience. But then, kind of, as we've talked more, um, I've really been reminded of the fact that, you know, it's not like you are an, an empty vessel to be no. filled with teaching knowledge. You know, you've come with your own experiences, with your own background. So it, it was a good reminder for me that all of our student teachers, as they're coming in, are resources for us as the experienced teachers to learn from just as much as we are resources for you guys to learn from uh, absolutely darren and and especially as i'm i'm a you know as you, you you might not tell from my voice but because i, I i'll be um i'll be 35 in june so as in um I, i'm i'm not the typical um you know student teacher however yeah. there are there are many of us who are like the, the experienced trainees and um you know, historically, my background was in a, a more motivational setting. So, like, guys, back into the brag, the brag is coming. <laughs> well. But back in 2016, I, I won a national award for innovative training program of the year. It was through the work on using axiology, the study of values systems, um, in order to 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 bring motivational situations to to, to people in in a fitness um, setting. Wow. So, so it is in my study of values is in I've been I've been bringing that to the classroom and trying to and trying to connect what the the students and um, what they value outside of the classroom to what we're doing inside of the classroom and how that can help them get going because um you know as Darren and I Darren and I are, are teaching languages in the United Kingdom and um we're, we're not always a favorite class <laughs> off the, as, at the start but then yes. but then we, but then we obviously quickly become their favorite club. Well, exactly. You know, we win the moment. <laughs> they can't help but love our lessons. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really cool, though. That's really cool because um, I, I think it's really important that we engage our students um, on their level, not in the really cringy way that turns them off by, you know, name dropping TikTok in every lesson and pretending that we are on their social media and all of that sort of thing but by understanding our students as people and making them realize why our subject is important to them because ultimately that's why they're in school isn't it they're in school because they are going to be functioning adults they're going to be in society and and we need to make them we need to show them why what we can do feeds into what they eventually want to do uh, absolutely, and, and and the thing about it is, is in often in some subjects, well, 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 why why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And you know, a little quote by the Buddha said, "Question everything, take nothing for granted." And I, you know, and this is why I was asked. I this is why I was keen to talk to Darren because, like, well, why are we doing it like this? Why, 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 why? Because I need to come up with those answers. Yeah, and I need to know why are we doing this because language is. Like, and guys, you know, I was dragged into this kicking and screaming. I think <laughs> dragged me into, into teaching. I, I had my own education business historically, and I did get into primary school teaching. Like, I, you know, I mean, I was accepted, but, but, but I ran away dutifully. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's there, there's a, in terms of language, language is the building blocks of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And without language, we can't express consciousness um so to, to, to one another isn't it's the primary thing for interaction so guys you know a hint uh, i'm i'm big into philosophy <laughs> like darren and that's why you know that's obviously why we connect but there there's many levels to this and uh and the why it's it's it's, it's critical because the thing is guys you know if you know if you're a teacher listening to this maybe you know this already if you're not a teacher but in the in 10 years time uh, forty percent of people I trained with, I mean, me, maybe me, I we won't be there, we won't be there. So there's a massive attrition rates, 
And just next year, 15% of the new teachers, they'll be gone. Yeah. 15%. Um, and that's difficult. And I find that, you know, someone saying, you know, just because I came from more like motivational space, when, when you look after the why, the how takes care of itself. So I, I'm really big on that for the kids as well. You know, as in when you look after the why, the how take is as in because as in um I, I'm doing I'm doing a study for an essay and that's why like Darren's a, <laughs> it's, it's a fantastic resource because he's very brainy guys. If you hadn't noticed, oh too kind. <laughs> but but one of the key researchers on, on the motivation, um, from one of uh you know one of our mentors peers uh. D- d- John, Dr. John Franco Conti just it was one of one of the fellows in his one of his books was saying that back in the day when when you had to learn a second language just because you had to do it everyone did it everyone could speak a second language yeah okay that too so guys it's as in I've been massively under the motivational aspect of language because I believe everyone can learn a second language absolutely everyone. absolutely and it's it is interesting isn't it when you think about how you know over even over the last like 20 years let's say since i left secondary school we've seen our young people have more autonomy you know i think our young people these days are more independent they're more aware of themselves than than certainly i was at school um and i think in in giving them that autonomy which is brilliant we have started to take away the oh well you're learning this because you have to learn it there is an argument to say we've almost done a disservice in that because like you said when people had to learn a second language they came away with one however rudimentary that knowledge may have been they still had that knowledge whereas now there's more choice there is more um more pressure on us as the teachers to to give them the why and and i think it's really easy for us to resist that and just say well they should have to learn but the fact is they don't and so as teachers, we do have to give them that motivation. And, and Darren, you're, you're dead right, because because guys, the power dynamic has shifted massively. Yeah. Um, you know, teachers, if you, if you acted the fool in class 40 years ago, they hit you with a big stick. <laughs> and they were legally allowed to do that, which is absolutely mental when you think about it. And it shows how far we've come in a society there where you don't learn language through coercion. And yeah. Physical, brutal, like physical brutality and coercion, like that. that's, well, yeah, I guess, I guess, of course, people did learn and when <laughs> if there's a big stick coming, you know, <laughs> coming behind you. But um, it, it is funny. And I, and I said this to someone, I put, I think I put it on, on social media, saying one of the reasons why I respect teachers so much, because at the beginning, you know, there was this terrible saying said, those who do, do, those who can't teach. Yeah. And that, like, that wormed its way into my head. And okay. it's the load of nonsense because the teaching is very doing <laughs> it, 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 it's incredibly doing but i i won't go down the you know i won't go down into the yeah <laughs> sorry i i won't digress on that one guys but but the, the the thing about it is we are basically like TikTok uh people ourselves mm. we're all day performing we have to write our scripts all day every day and whatever it says public speaking oh my god like that's people's like second biggest fear after death <laughs> and we're doing it all day every day um and it, it's 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 tiring it's like it's yeah. really tiring and and the thing is especially in languages as in so you, you know if you're not in it you wouldn't be familiar but but there's massive cuts you know it's like if a if a if the management of a school they're like oh there's not that many kids there uh maybe we'll get rid of the sixth form then maybe you get rid of the gcse in in, in german for instance you know as in yeah. you know, that Darren learned independently, absolute madman. Um, but but there's a massive pressure on us to be entertaining. Yes. Jails people. So like we are like language teachers particularly are motivational leaders because like at least in English and and in maths, well you gotta be there, you know, as in there's you know it's it's state mandated. But yeah. with us we really have to become motivators and psychologists yeah. and, and educators yeah it is there is it, it's really horrible to say but there is so much competition between subjects you know our year nines right now are making their gcse option choices there are a finite number of hours there is a finite number of hours in the day there are only so many subjects that they can take and so you know in order to 
retain our jobs in many cases, we need to make sure that we've got bums on seats. We need to make sure we've got kids in the classroom. And that does mean a certain amount of showmanship, a certain amount of sales, um, so that we can show them the value of what we're teaching them. And, and guys, it's mad because as in the, the school of thought I'm from is, um, you know, Cardinal John Newman, who was, um, he was a theologist and, and later he was beatified actually recently. So it's Saint um, Cardinal John Newman or Saint John Newman or Saint yeah. Newman. Um, <laughs> and, and he was talking about the, the liberal education versus the, the oh, sorry, guys, the, the servile education. Okay. So education as for its own means, as education, as a way to develop the intellect and the ability to search out truth. Mm -hmm. And as, 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 a, as developing that inner compass towards truth. And, and that's how I connect to education. I'm like, as in, does it help you live, lead a more truthful existence? And languages that like learning French is what I do is it's that socially validated, approved way of coming to meet children to teach them about the search of truth. Yeah. But, but I have to pretend it's about French only, you know? <laughs> but it's about consciousness because language is the way to convey consciousness and, and empathy and understanding. Because guys, if you speak another language, you, you tap into a whole other part of you. It's, it's, um, very, it's, it's very, it's very, it's, it's, it's kind of mystical even. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is, but it, it's, it's interesting what you say about truth because just thinking about it really quickly while you were talking we all know that um that toddlers for example when they're three years old their favorite word after no will be why so very very young children have this innate curiosity they want to know things they they assert themselves by saying no because they want to take some kind of semblance of control over their lives and then they ask why because they want to understand and somewhere along the way that disappears and that curiosity goes and i think it'd be really interesting if we could figure out how we keep that curiosity alive how we nurture that so that even when they are 16 and, and jaded and too cool for school literally they still want to know and they still want that truth absolutely you know and and guys you know i i, I think darren you know invited me and not on for a philosophy of <laughs> next year but but for it to be a new teacher and, and obviously i'm doing everyone's head in around me you know the expert teachers asking them well why 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 because you know i, I think that it is an intellectual profession yeah and and especially on the harder subjects like you know i, I don't you know every subject every te all teaching hard because it, it's a lot of hard work but but on some of them where we don't have as much legislative support you got to think a little bit deeper yeah yeah you do because eventually you can find your subject being undermined um so some some colleagues from my of mine from another school for example um one of them in fact was was my french teacher at school um i connected with them a little while ago to do some liaison between our schools and she told me that her, she was um french uh french teacher but only French. She didn't have a second language because she graduated when you didn't need one. It was OK to just teach French. Um, and she told me that her timetable was actually more life skills than it was French because there just wasn't the the uptake. And so she had to, to pivot and give up a big part of what she loved about teaching, which was sharing her knowledge of her passionate subject with children. Um, in order to pivot into something else so that she had a job. The, well, Darren, what I would say to that lady, though, is that language is life skills. As in, guys, as in, if you go out there and overcoming yourself, as in the courage to speak in a language that you don't know, that your fear of, will I be understood? Will I look silly? Did I say this wrong? I, like, I find that languages is, learning is like the ultimate personal development tool, actually. You know, absolutely as in, as in so, so so i would invite that lady to like just look at like reframe it as in i i do i, I don't know the specifics in the situation <laughs> but the language learning is personal development and and i guys i'm a massively into that personally you know and and uh and you know my own personal relationship with truth but it, it languages guys it, it's it's fantastic for that and and 
and that was why you know coming back as a new teacher or a trainee teacher it was quite simple for me because i never stopped learning like every morning i get up at 5 a.m i'll read scripture i'm going on courses i'm always continuously developing and and that is what i'm looking to transfer to the students through my own modeling of that and yeah energy that, that I bring to and, and guys Darren this way Darren and I connected Darren's got like three masters doing a PhD and, and he works <laughs> I don't know he's and, and he speaks maybe seven languages guys so so you know it's it's the learner for life you know I, I'm I'm onto my fourth language now hey there's uh you know guys it, it's it's just mad you know just like and this because we want this we want the students to be learners for life because it's yes. adaptation because like someone's saying, I don't know if it's true or not, but they said forty percent of the jobs the kids will be doing in the future in our schools, they don't, they haven't been invented yet. Yeah. And I was like, whoa! Because when I was in school, uh, even like a few years, like when I was in, I'd say A levels, um, I I ended up doing this thing called pay per click advertising, you know, like basically the Google ads, as in when I came out of university, because I just didn't want to, you know, I was like, no, destiny, no. <laughs> I wanted to do work in business and in marketing. So I was in Facebook advertising, like that job. I was doing that job for like the first two, three years of my career because I was like, oh, I went to Facebook. And so so it just is, is that teaching about adapt- adaptability and to be a lifelong learner. Yeah, absolutely. And and our young people do need that modeled for them um, because it's not everywhere. It It's not... Um, it's not a common thing generally unfortunately um and you know it's not even in the same way that you know we've said we teach in the uk and in the uk languages are not valued as as much as they are elsewhere i don't even think that the the lack of lifelong learning is a uk issue um i think it's yeah, that's a world issue <laughs> it, it really is it really is and it's because people just don't don't have time you know, again, like we were saying about options, there are there's a finite number of hours in the day, and you know people are going to prioritize other things when they are done with work over learning, and 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 that's that's their choice. Um, but for me as a teacher, because I trained, I I actually did train primary, um, so I have a B Ed. I did that five years before making the transition, and one of the things that we were always told at uh, during our training was never ask the kids to do something in front of you that you would not be willing to do in front of them and that was a big part of our mfl training so it was don't expect the kids to speak to you in french if you're not willing to speak back to them in french and and for me that has become part of all of my practice so even down to how can i expect you how can i ask you guys to learn things if i'm not learning things as well it's a lack of leadership, isn't it? If you do. But I do think it's really important for for us to to be good role models again for our subject to show them why it's important. You know, to show them that by studying French, they've got more options in life than just becoming a French teacher. It's not kind of some kind of self perpetuating cycle. We're not French teacher factories. <laughs> But that they can go out and they can run their business. They can be a motivational speaker in Paris instead of in London. You know, and, and if they don't see us doing that, the, the people who are supposedly so excited about our subject that we're dedicating our lives to teaching it, then where else are they going to get that message from? And, and the thing about it is, like, is in, that's even the notion of the, the servile thinking that, that there has to be this direct application of it it, it guys it, it actually if you don't if you, if you learn languages like you can just what it does is it inculcates open-mindedness mm-hmm. and geez guys what can we do open open-mindedness lots of things because because you know it's open-mindedness you need to be open to ideas if you if you consider a creative person uh, or if you you know a person who wants to create solutions for others and do it in a you know commercial sense or intellectual sense or spiritual physical anything you have to be open-minded open to see new ideas yeah. and if you don't continue languages on that no worries guys like you know the, 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 no skin off our nose but it, it does help you become open, more open-minded and, and that's one of the beauties of it 
And in my case, you know, I was in, you know, getting a French wife, you know, was in, <laughs> it, it had a very practical um, application. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's, um, let's delve into something a little bit more that could potentially be a bit more controversial. Um, but you did bring it up earlier, so it's entirely your fault. Um, yeah. There are retention issues within teaching within the first five years. Um, I spoke about this on the show a few weeks ago. I did a show called um, Why Bother Teaching, where I talked about, um, I, I gave stories from some of my colleagues about why they went into the profession in the first place. If you haven't listened to that show, please do go back through our archives because you can find it. Um, but from your point of view, as somebody relatively new into the classroom and relatively new into the classroom as a teacher, why is that? From your perspective, why do you think we have such low retention rates? So the thing about it is, so yeah, I, I've come from, you know, uh, the commercial as in like yeah. the business setting, as in I worked in marketing for uh, for many years um, and I had my own uh, education company. And it, it's in one part of it, like, is in I was talking to, 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 to Diana about this, but my, like the hardest part for, for, for teaching with me was the structure to be subjugated to the, the education system. Mm -hmm. okay. And no disrespect system, but it's a bit of a meat grinder. It's a bit of a meat grinder. The way it's set up is, um, is if you want to be an amazing teacher, it's a, it's, it's a life. You have to yeah. give your life to it. As in, um, one of my clients, because I, you know, I do some, some coaching, I said, and, you know, one of his, his daughters, they're, you know, we're, we're helping, we're talking about what private school, you know, and, and guys, you know, private schools are, they're very expensive in the United Kingdom. They are, God bless me, expensive. Um, and, you know, this man, he's, you know, works, he's a partner of a law firm in the, in the city of London, the Silver Circle one, which, you know, he's Cambridge educated and everything. But there's not a lot of money left over after sending the, the, the children to private to, to private school. As such, there's you know the people there they demand a lot, you yeah. know. Um, and and he's telling me about some of these schools are six days a week. Yes, they're six days a week. And imagine to be that professional that has to give up your life to do that because the thing is, he was saying, well, the thing about it is, if you get the kids in the six days a week. It's, you know, almost like a, a, a business upsell where, where they'll get you on, you'll just end up putting the kids in full boarding because you will never have a weekend. You will never be able to go anywhere because you can't leave on Friday night because, you know, you know, little Timmy or Jane has, the, has school on Saturday morning till 2 p.m. And there's teachers doing this. They're living that life as in it's, it's, it's so demanding. It is so demanding. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, on one edge of the side, like there's this mass inequality in the system. And one is that the private schools, they are being paid so much, but they're demand so much. And then in the, I'm in a, currently in a, in a school in a very deprived area. And I absolutely love it. I was like, oh, I was like, oh, I thought I might, you know, I, was like, I thought the private school thing might be for me, but, you know, you never know where, where life will take you. Yeah. But I'm in a deprived area and I love it. And I love it. And the thing is, though, the resources are not there. Um, there is a lot of work to do with turning the area around in terms of mentality, with appreciation of, of um, academia. And, and that, that, that there's more to life than, you know, th th than they might believe. Yeah. And, and not having the resources because a lot of the, the, the students in our school, um, like 30% of them are carers. Like okay. they're, child, they're child carers. And that is, so then they come into school where they're like in home. They are, they're, they're the boss around the house. Yeah. Like they're cooking the dinner, they're cleaning the clothes, they're washing the things um, while their parents are unable to, to look after themselves. And um, then they come into school and I say, hey, uh, Natasha, Jack it off before you come into the room. Like, guys, but in the school, like, we have to have rules. But the thing is, Natasha's like, are you serious? It's like, yeah. be, be, as you, if you're an adult and you come to the room, so I'm telling you that, it, it, it would grate on you. So there's a lot of conflict that, come, that arises from that of these children who are growing up before their time. Yeah. Um, and then there is a... I, I, when I was in school, I just don't remember there being this much you know, neurodiversity. 
Um, I don't remember there being this much uh, needs. Um, and of course, you know, one of the things is like, I was, I was in most in boys' schools, but young boys and teenage boys, they need to run around a lot. They need mm-hmm. high intensity play. And I find that with the sc- screen addiction culture that we have right now, that they're not getting that. So I find that I hear that, like, my understanding is that the classrooms are more difficult because these boys are not getting to expel their energy. And, you know, every kid now, every second kid is ADHD. And, and, and you know, from some of the research I've done, it's like true ADHD is actually, it's quite rare. Um, but, but some of these boys, they are unable to sit in place um, because they're probably not getting enough energy off. And, um, and, and then, so you're doing all that all day and the emotion load of, you know, as I said earlier on, you're, you're running your own TikTok show or you're on your own YouTube channel all day, every day, you're, you're, you're scripting it at night or on the weekends. So it's a six day a week job, even if you're in the public system, um, like, I mean, public by comprehensive, yeah. uh, is state run and you, the emotional load of that is it's, it's it's incredible. And, and also what, what I, I thought was like, oh, teachers, oh my God, they got this week off, they got that week <laughs> off. And, summer. and the thing about it is, you know, while I've been off on my Easter holidays, even as a trainee teacher, I'm doing academic work. I'm planning yeah. lessons uh, because I have to, I can't go in there empty handed. I can't go because, because and, and the thing is, it's not like back in the day when you just had a little textbook, the kids, their demands for, stimulation mm-hmm. have increased because they're we're up against multi-billion pound companies with data scientists who are reducing children's attention spans to like seven second windows yeah and we are battling that and it's extremely exhausting and the people who can do it are extremely resilient people as i, I i'm i'm actually not going to be a full-time teacher in september okay um, i i just i don't think i couldn't like it's not for me i'll do part-time okay and I'll, do, and I'll do tutoring and i'll keep my coaching business because i can make more money on half it and like on half time week than i can on a full-time week and i can have several days off during it days off during the week um and it's it's the sacrifice is so high sacrifice is so yeah. high and um, a lot of people they're not cut out for that because the education system is it's there's far too much load on per person there should be i i don't know the solutions because i don't know the solutions but but there's too much on each person and as such they just get worn out um and people they're not they're like they're not built to run youtube channels because guys you don't know what nowadays kids are like to entertain them all day long in subjects that they're not like think that especially like in language because what they don't just say some kids in my area they, they've come in at year seven so you know 11 years old saying nope not doing it not doing it hate languages la 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 they got their fingers in their ears and the the closed mindedness um but the thing is they still have to be in your class and you still have to deal with them um, and work with them and it's because it's extremely difficult um in other classes like maths and, and english because they have to be there there is there's a grudging cooperation, but in, in other subjects, as in, and especially because in this country, there's a perception that languages are difficult. So then, you know, as in some people just, they're not up for that challenge or, or they just, the juice is not worth the squeeze. And, and because of that, like at this, it's a myriad of factors. And, and then obviously guys, you know, I, I don't need to tell you about this, but the, the pay is, is very, very poor. And you, like I'm coming from the private sector and the private sector, when I was two years into my marketing, I am, um, I was like, but no qualifications to marketing. Like I just rocked up. I, had, I did like a three month paid internship in marketing, got a job. And within two years, I was on the same salary as a, um, as a new teacher like, yeah. and like without any of the skill. Like, I mean, I mean, I had the commercial skill, but as in what these people like, is in if you are an able person, you know, and could just do something else like life doesn't have to be that hard unfortunately i i and darren have vocation like as in like i'm like <laughs> i'm like i've got a vocation so i have to do it because i've tried everything else first but isn't it's for all of these reasons that i'm observing that the new t- 
teachers then they're not able for yeah i mean it's you you brought up exactly what i was going to say is the v word isn't it the fact is that vocations are exploited and it's not just us we, we see it the same with nursing we see it with doctors people say oh well you've got a calling and so you don't need to be paid as much and it's like well yes i've got a calling but i've also got a house that has a mortgage yeah i need to well guys i don't have a house or a mortgage i'm 35 uh, soon because i don't have a mortgage i was like i'm renting accommodation and and like with the with the pay it's like okay 20 year teachers are on like the money they're on is it's appalling it's really i don't know how they live no i don't know how to no um i think that quite often you know i look at my colleagues in, in all sorts of different different home situations and i think most people are struggling even in you know i know teachers who are two income household holds with no children you know the the dink lifestyle double income no kids but they still struggle yeah yeah that and doesn't it's... surprise me no no it's it's sad it's sad um and i i also think and i kind of hadn't pieced this together until what you were saying about young carers but I feel like sometimes we forget how little time children are actually in school. We as teachers remember that we're there all the time. We make jokes that we sleep there, and sometimes that feels sadly true. But we are actually only a very small part of our children's day. We are maybe a quarter of the children's day. And they've got a whole lot going on outside of us. So they might be carers. They might have extracurricular activities they might work in some cases and all of those things will impact what happens when they come and sit in our classroom and i i think that the undermining of social services in general and the undermining of the help that there is for the children outside of the classroom has had a huge impact on what goes on inside of the classroom because all of a sudden school has to be everything we are the psychologists we are the therapists we are the um careers advisors we are everything to these young people in six hours a day contact time and we're trying to educate them and i i, I do think that a lot of uh, not the hardship of our job because as one of of my mentor teacher said to me we are one of the only professions where you need to do work at home so you've got work to do at work <laughs> yeah. uh, and 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 that won't go away but i think if there were more social services if there were more support if there were more kids clubs so that the boys could go and run off some energy before they come into school or know that they were going to go and do that after school then a lot of at least the the behavior stuff and the in-person difficulties might be alleviated just a little but it's it it's sad Really, it's sad for me to to listen to you, somebody I know is very passionate about education. Um, somebody who, as you said yourself, has felt called to this, but still turn around and say, you know, I'm I'm not even a year into the classroom yet. Cause you're doing a is it a one year training program you're on? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you are like what, eight, nine months in the classroom and you've already said, I I can't do this full time. It's it it's it, 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 I love myself too much. I, 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 I have to do like, I have to make it, I have to make it work for me and my, for my family. As yes. And, and it, it doesn't pay to work in teaching. No. Like, it's like, it, 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 that's the really sad thing. It's like, it's not just things like, oh, I can just be a teacher and, and like, I get to live indoors and I can live in a, in a, in a nice place. There's, that's not how it is. And, and I was watching, I was, I was fun. I was just, I got, I, I, cause I got Disney plus and it was very good actually. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not a paid sponsor. Uh, but, but guys, he, there was a Malcolm in the middle. It was a show and, and, it, and it was, um, Malcolm, we know he's a very bright boy and, and his teacher is a public school teacher and he's just like so poor and run down. And I think it's foreshadows what's happened in the United Kingdom education system. But this was, was a show when I was like, this must be 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and in, in America, they are already experiencing the same thing in the high schools over there. And I was fascinated because he's this bitter, penniless teacher 
he was very bright and like he works with genius kids but he's he's like can't make it by and it's like he turned into this figure of fun yeah and it's and it is funny but but he can't live like that you know no no not at all not at all and it, it is really difficult and you know we were saying before i hit record on our call today we were saying that we're at the end of the easter holiday right now it's um, we're actually coming to you from the past today is the 14th of april oh, um oh, oh, breaking the fourth wall there <laughs> i know i know um and, and we were saying you know the easter holiday has come to an end and we are only just now beginning to feel like normal functioning people we we've overcome the exhaustion finally and we are just now, you know, as the holiday is ending, feeling like we might be able to do things that normal people would do on their holiday. And then we know that Monday morning will come and we're back to it. And, and, and Darren, like, is in even the, the, the on the first um, half term, like, guys, Darren, you know, he's been incredible to bat things back and forth with intellectually. Uh, but I, I had it in one of my essays and which was like, you know, thank God I got a first on it. But the day after I got COVID and then like I was just shattered because yeah. I was just working, doing doing the classwork, doing the academic work. Like, you know, it's important to me to get the grades. I want to role model for the kids. Yeah. I, I want to say, well, you know, I, I'm not the most gifted guy in the world, but I put the, I put a shift in it and I got a good result. And but after that, I was I got COVID. I was out of school for a week. Uh, for another week, I had brain fog due to it. Um, and it's just like if I had classes on, like if I had read, like because I was changing departments, it, it wasn't such a big deal. But if I had class on, that'd be disastrous. Yeah. Because I'm yeah. just like, because how hard, well, how much you have to give? It's a lot. It is. It is. And, you know, I mean, sickness is, that could be a whole other show on, on teaching when you're not very well. Um, because mm-hmm. of course you, you've got the, you've got the toss up between do I power through go in and transmit my illness to the 120 kids and 70 adults that I'm going to see today or do I attempt to set some cover work which might not make sense to anybody because I'm not entirely sure that I'm thinking properly because I'm not very well it's um it's difficult one I think one of the the benefits that came from covid and the enforced time off when we when we had to isolate um, is that people generally now teachers generally now are more conscious of that, and and I do think I, I know I personally have found myself more willing to take my sick days than I was before um, because I've realised we don't get perfect attendance certificates. Kids might do, and again, that's a whole other issue about rewarding perfect attendance but we don't and so you know we need to to look after ourselves uh, absolutely absolutely and, and it, it's it's um and the thing is guys in, in you know in one of the schools i was at I, I had the idea to bring in my air filter air purifier okay and then they said oh you need to get a pat check or something yeah so, so it could be uh, insurance ready and then they said, ah, no, can't do your thing. Because then if we did your one, we have to do everyone's one. The, the guys, you know, the, the site managers. So, like, I'm going to work in environment where I, like, don't have, get to do the best chance to do well just because, you know, the guys and the site managers, they're overwhelmed as well. Because mm-hmm. the, the, the cuts that they're facing are, like, because, guys, when I was doing my applications for um, for teaching, I uh, like during COVID because I had a live like my my education was in a lot of live events mm-hmm. and and uh, I I did some work as site manager as in as in I was I was TA I was cover supervisor <laughs> I, was site, I did the site manager because the money was better because I okay. got paid more for cleaning up the yard picking up the wrappers in the yard than I did for looking after the children in the classroom. Okay. So, so right. I, of course, I was, I was going to take it because I was. Yeah, no, there. absolutely. I was there to make a living. Yes. Um, which is just mad, but but the, those guys, they're overwhelmed. But the thing is, it's made the classroom unsafe for me because I can't get fresh air. I can't get like because these kids, you know, as in there's a cross pollination of, you know, <laughs> of all the colds and this thing and that thing. Um. Yeah. 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 It. <laughs> It's sad, isn't it, when you actually sit and think about it, you know, because we all make jokes about um, 
the back to school lurgy, you know, everybody is unwell the first two weeks of September. Um, and and I suppose it's almost a gallows humour thing where we make light of it to cope with the fact that it happens. But we know it happens because, of course, if you put 35 children and one or two adults in a confined space, the bugs are going to go around. And, and it's gotten to the point where we are just expected to deal with that and make jokes about it because that's just part of our job. And And... There's just a lot of it's part of the job. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But, but Dan, I, I, you know, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I don't want to come across like I've got an axe to grind. I, I, <laughs> I, I would, as in, um, I'd love to, you know, just give some of the tips actually for for trainee teachers. Some of the things that that, that I've found. Um, yeah, please do, please do. That would be really good. Well, some of the things is in one of the most important things for the for the training teachers to remember is, guys, you are paying an absolute fortune to do this. You know, like as I'm paying nine thousand pounds, I've never spent nine thousand pounds on anything <laughs> ever. Um, I come from Ireland. I've never had we never had uh, big school fees like that. Mm -hmm. um, and as such, it's it's for it's for the the PGCs or the the skid trainees. Remember. You are the you're 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 like the customer. You're like the customer is like as in some people they get into thinking that I work here, and then they don't want to rock the boat. But but I've seen many cases of students being left without mentors. Okay. Teach, teachers have had no mentoring over the course of a year. It's like guys, I don't care how smart you are, as in trying to learn about mentorship. It's it's a, uh, you know, it's yeah. it is very very. Difficult. I mean, yes. I, I like, as in, the thing is, there's a program called a Teach First, and, and they have something like that where you basically seem to get, like, you're just thrown, completely thrown into the team. Yeah. It's like an SNS program. And honestly, the people that come out, they're, they're very impressive in their way. But but for anyone else, you need someone to give you feedback. Yeah. You need someone to get you feedback. Um, it just, that's just like, to be a teacher, you need someone to talk to. Yes. And um, if you are a trainee teacher, assert yourself. You are, but you are paying a lot of money to be there. Assert yeah. yourself. I mean, yeah. Make sure that you are getting everything that you need to become successful. Because you don't want to be the statistic. That's fair. That's fair. And I'm, I'm going to kind of hop on that and say to anybody who is in your current situation, so people who might be job hunting for next year, ready to start their ECT time um make the most of your mentor because actually i think that mentorship has a place in schools no matter what stage of your career you are in um you know you you get to my point where you, i i've been in school 16 years and but i still want somebody who is more experienced than me to help me to be better yeah. and and i i think i think mentorship and teaching is really important and and so absolutely if you know if you are paying for your training if you are a trainee teacher then you need that mentor it's not fair on you not to have it and it's not fair on the children that you're teaching to be left with somebody who is not being nurtured um so make sure that you do you do demand that know your worth um and know what you are paying for but similarly when you are an ect when you are 10 years in, when you are 16 years in, when you are 30 years in, find your work BFF and learn from that person and, and be somebody else's mentor as well. Make it a reciprocal relationship because I think it's very easy to close your classroom door and pretend that no other teachers exist and that it's just you and the kids. And that just means you become stuck in your way as a teacher. You become stuck in your own practice and you never get better. And then if you don't get better and the things change, and then you might find yourself getting thrown out. Like Absolutely. Or you might find the door that way because you didn't apply yourself to getting better. So it's, it's critical. Yeah. And another thing is, guys, you know, as in, I, uh, I, I think Faith had it, had it in for me to, to do this, but what... As in, guys, look for the look for the, there's there's many ways in there's many ways in because I am um, with the PGC I was interested in that 
But I, I'd spent a lot of time in the school, so I kind of wanted to get more school contact time. So guys, um, the skit is a, it's a, well, how do, what's, what's that, the school? Sorry, guys. Oh, I, yeah, Joe, you know, I can't remember. There's so many, there's so many acronyms in education, <laughs> godly, but basically it means you're in the school and you're teaching, um, you know, 30% uh, up to Christmas, then 60% and 80%. Uh, it, and it's great to get that context because I hear a lot of people who just did uni um, that the first year out is brutal. I've heard a lot of people say that, but this is a nice slower way to ramp up. Yeah. But don't fall in the trap of not doing the intellectual work because a lot of the skit people, they think this, oh, they want to do all practical. But guys, to be, you know, because being a teacher, it is intellectual. It's an intellectual pursuit. You know, you, you are... It's not purely practical, like you need to think because you need to be reflective and, and the PGC guys, it's, it's critical it's, or, or whatever, well, you know, maybe you're doing it somewhere else, but to have that critical engagement with your profession and to know why you're doing it. Yeah. And, and, and even my academic essays have helped my lesson planning because they've helped me develop my internal intellectual compass as to why am I putting this in the lesson, not that why is it this much or not that much and i, I and guys it only crystallized like this easter like this easter guys and i've been doing it for a little bit of time now um and guys there's there's organizations like teach first which is basically like the sas commandos um ton of people drop out of it but you're paid um so the thing is like i i i actually wanted to be a primary school teacher as mm -hmm. well as what i wanted to do but uh, there was no grants going for it, but I, but I had a degree in French because that French was, was my liberal education, just my, like, just for, for love of learning. Um, but I went on the French way and I got paid about 18,000 pounds, which is, you know, you know, these days, and uh, it's not insignificant. No. I needed that. As, in I, I'm, as I said, I'm a man in my 30s and I like living indoors. <laughs> and that's very important to me. Uh, same if you have like psychology or something or like a scientifically oriented subject, you could get the grant for being a, a science teacher. Because guys, you, you know, you need to you need to work with the system uh, uh, as it is. And then there are also salaried teacher roles. Mm -hmm. You know, those guys, a bit of baptism by fire as well. It's it's a bit of a, like the teach first is the ultimate baptism by, by fire because there's a high intellectual standard and a grinding um day to day but the but the salary is still very difficult because they're they're doing a lot of hours uh uh but it's a way to get through it without going into debt but yeah. guys, as in i just it's just heartbreaking a friend of mine um in the course he uh he's he, he didn't make it through he had to withdraw because you know whether he was right had the right persona for teaching you know that's 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 up for debate but um, guys, if you because if you don't get your QTS, you can't come back and do it again. I hear. Um, so, but if you withdraw, you can come back again. Okay. So, so the thing was, this man he paid nine thousand pounds to do his all his work, and he um, he like lost a year of income, and had to pay like had to live at home and all of these sacrifices. He made huge sacrifices. So it's it's even worth checking with the people around you. Like, like, are you a teacher? Do you have that person? Like, is that is that in you? Um, you know, you know, to use a terrible line from *Chariots of Fire*, like, you know, you, you can't put in what God left out. And with the teaching, it, it it is a persona. It is a certain type of person. Um, it's just because it's a huge sacrifice to do it and not make it. Yeah god it's just it's hard like it because we've had three people um leave our course out of 20 uh or wow okay less than 20 we've had three people drop out of our program um so it's worth check with the people around you like do you think that i'm the right person because one lady was a, like a genius phd but um was a more reserved introverted kind of personality didn't make it. Another, another lovely gentleman. Uh, after two months, he's like, no, as in, because he just didn't. The behavior management just didn't like it. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, that's not to say that you can't be a teacher. Maybe you could be in um, 
in the college educator or for adults as there's many different types of education but to see these like college or um or uh sorry i, I don't <laughs> the second school in Ireland was called yeah. second school. But um, <laughs> is that for you? Because the investment is huge. Yeah, I, I think that's a really a really good point. And um, and I would say, if you can, um, if you are currently thinking about going into teacher training and potentially the school centered initial teacher training, Google yes. is our friend. <laughs> um. Maybe see if you can do some work experience first, do some volunteering if you can. Um, it is slightly more difficult these days to volunteer in schools than it was um, for a mixture of COVID and safeguarding reasons. But if you are able to get into the type of school that you think you would like to teach in and spend a, a week, if you are able, very low pressure, but just to see if it is the right environment for you and whether you are the right person for it then that could save you a lot of financial and emotional hardship in the long run and, and guys even like if you were to become a um a cover supervisor it's because because the barriers to entry are a bit lower on that it seems to think anyone with a pulse it felt like uh, <laughs> um but because the thing is as, as darren said they are reluctant to just random people just walk into the school mm. as they should be yes like, absolutely as, as they should be and guys, even schools like the grammar schools are heavily oversubscribed schools. They actually have things on their website saying, don't ask us for um, for volunteering. We are not accepting people. Like, we don't care if you've done this, that, that, or we're just not taking people. Because guys, other people have thought of it before as, as a way into a private school or this kind of school. Uh, right, cover supervisor or, or a teaching assistant, those are much easier ways to get in where you can have, where you can like actually get into the school yeah, and, and uh, relatively easily. Um, the, 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 that's, those are the easier ways to get in because because one of the things is even me as a trainee teacher, getting a one day placement in a school was extremely difficult. And I had to um, pull strings. I had to like get heads of department to get me recommendations for like the school that their kid went to. And um, so, just to say this, what we're going to talk about, it is like if you've got connections, fair enough. But if you don't, that's a very difficult um, path to go down, get, trying to get those volunteer days. You're better off uh, getting getting paid. Listen, you, you, could, you could do it because, you know, even, even if you were had a day job, you could take a few days off work. You could, you could just do some, uh, some cover supervisor. As in, as in, you could take maybe take a week off work and then like, and then do cover supervisor for a week, and then you it'd be a low risk way of assessing whether you're set for this one and an ability to have a high variety of schools because you might get sent to five different schools in that week. Yeah, depending where you live. Yeah, um, and I will say in in defense of schools, it's not that we don't want volunteers necessarily because as as we know, we are all um, oversubscribed and need. As, as much help as possible it's that quite often the bureaucracy um in terms of all of the paperwork the risk assessments everything that needs to be filled in in order to have a volunteer um outweighs ultimately the benefit of having somebody in especially if it is only for a a short time so you know we would again i, I taught primary it would have been lovely to have parents grandparents come in to listen to the kids read but it, with with safeguarding as it is rightfully so very very high at the top of our priority the top of everything that we do it is much more difficult these days to to justify that yeah yeah mm -hmm. so, so guys, as in you, you can get in by that way and, and it's a good way to see is it for me yeah because the thing is it, 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 teaching we said the v word it, it's vocational like is in because you're not going into teaching for the money. Like, absolutely not. You're not doing it for the money. And um, you have to do it for the love. And uh, and it's worth checking that out first. Yes. Because it's an expensive, because the thing is, it's not like, oh, I trained to be a mathematician. It's like, well, then you might go into finance and you might go into engineering. You could do lots of different things. But teaching, it, it is quite particular. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like, it's not like, I, I, I've been asking, like, where do teachers go? Like, what, what do they do afterwards? I'm not getting super clear answers. <laughs> I mean, it, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because there are lots of transferable skills. Of course. Um, of course. You know, so our ability to improvise our organization, um, our subject knowledge, our understanding of people, all of those things are transferable. But those things alone are not worth doing the training for. So, you oh. know, I, I it, it's definitely not a case of, oh, I'll go and do my PGCE. And then after that, I will definitely go and work in an office and I will use my PGCE skills. You may as well just go and get your job in the office. Um, and, and, and equally, if, if that is what you want to do, the, the, the teach first, guys, is in, um, like, it's in the name, teach first <laughs> and then do something else. Because a lot of them don't stay for teaching. Because it, you know, it, it called like it's one of the so-called charities. It's like it's not a it's it's a it's a graduate recruitment business. Yeah, but they often go into Deloitte and they go into all of these big f corporate firms. If that's if you want to have a little taste of teaching and then want to do something else, it's already there. But don't waste your time and money yeah. on traditional teaching approach because that is that's for teachers. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think. The other thing I wanted to add, since since we're dishing out advice, um, just kind of um, pick up on what you said earlier, is the the importance of the pedagogy, the importance of of understanding why you are doing what you're doing, because uh, it may have changed. It probably has changed in the last sixteen years, but certainly when I was training. Um, all throughout my three years of my B.Ed., we were told, watch your teachers, make the most of these observations, you know, because you're going to learn so much from them. And you do. You absolutely do. But I think being as far into the career now as I am, I think a lot of that, that excitement about observation that came from our lecturers is because when you get to this stage of your career, you wish that you could go back and watch other people to get some new ideas. And I think what quite often happens is we become convinced that observation is the only way to learn to be a teacher that you have to go and sit and watch everybody else and then do exactly what they're doing and we're not always reminded of the fact that these people know what they're doing because they have studied the reasons for it because they know why so you could go in and you could teach a the exact same um, activity as another teacher in the exact same way, and it could fall apart where it worked for the other teacher. And the reason that it fell apart isn't because you did it wrong, but it's because you didn't understand necessarily why you were doing it, and so you couldn't make it fit you. So when you're doing your reading um, and when you're doing your observations, do so critically. Think about what can I take from this pedagogy that works for my personality, that works for my teacher persona. I have a, an episode on teacher personas from a few months ago. If you haven't listened to that, please do go back and check that out. Um, but, but do understand why. Do the reading, do the psychology, because that ultimately is the most important thing, because you're not going to always mimic the person you're observing you're going to to use the learning that you've internalized. I hope I've, I've expressed that in the way I wanted to. It, the thing is, though, Darren, you have expressed it, but the thing is, you just have to go into it. Um, it, it it's very experiential. It's very experiential, as in it, it took on, like it took me doing the PGC to learn the pedagogy, to, to go after it, to really go deep into the research. Um, in order to to get anywhere on that, yeah. Because, and like in, in Darren Rice field, there's a guy called Dr. John Franco Cantian, and you know, there's a lot of teachers in you know, he's got a lot of fans and he's got some detractors as well. And some of them say, oh, but da 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 da, and and they they act as if he's making it up himself. And it's like, guys, you haven't read the literature. He's there's a guy called uh, Stephen Cra Dr. Stephen Crashen. He's like this genius linguist, and who actually a lot of Dr. Conti's work is based on that yeah he didn't make anything up he didn't it's not his he didn't he just put it together in, in a pleasing way and i i I'm, <laughs> i i really like it as in because the kids have a lot of fun and i have fun and when the kids have fun i have fun but know why they're doing it yeah no way yeah. 
Because the, the traditional approach at the moment, like for most teachers and languages, it's, it's like basically show and tell. It's called PPP. And it's like, here's some language. Here's how, here's, you know, here's me doing it, you know, manipulating it. You go do it. Um, and for me, that's not enough. Like as in, as in modeling is a very powerful way of teaching, but it's not enough. There's there, like, you need, you need to model intelligently. Um, and it relies too much on students motivation, which, which will work for the top of the class because because those guys are the, are the gifted ones, but you want to move the middle bulge and, and technique will help you with that middle bulge. It, th th that's been my understanding of it so far. Yeah. I mean that. Again, we're coming up with things that could be entire shows for themselves. I know. Um, <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I've been taking I've been taking Darren all over the place. No, you're good. You're good. It's fine. It's fine. Um, people who listen to Saturday Breakfast know by now that we go off on tangents here. It's all good. It's all good. Um, it's for, me, <laughs> for me, it's really interesting because I think for me, modeling is the teaching part of teaching and learning. And that's why teachers get so wrapped up in it because it's the part that we control. But modeling doesn't actually help learning. Modeling is teaching, learning is experiential, and we need both. We as teachers provide, we as teachers do teaching and we provide the opportunity for learning. And that doesn't mean, it, it's why we're told not to stand up and deliver a 45 minute lecture and then send our year 10s on their way. It's not because we're boring. I mean we might be but i can be in denial about that but it's because no learning takes place only teaching and and so it is about remembering that it's a two-way street that we have our role to play in doing the teaching and providing the learning opportunities but then we have to let the kids do the learning and that means that we let go we step back and we say it's your turn now it's, it's you know guys in academic circles are going to synthesizing information that's like yeah yeah it's, yes it's, and it it did take me a long time as, as a new teacher to learn that um to to have that ability to let go um so again giving out advice to to people thinking of going into teaching or um people starting to looking for their first jobs don't be afraid to let go. If you feel like you are doing nothing in part of your lesson because the kids are all working, it means that something is going right. If you are talking for 100% of your lesson, you might feel like you're in control. You might feel like your lesson is going well because all of the kids are sitting and listening, but they're not learning, you're just teaching. So do let go. Do let the kids get on with it. Obviously circulate, don't just get your phone out and start scrolling Instagram. Um, but it, it's not all about you. We feel like it is sometimes in our classroom, but it's about the kids and it's about making sure we provide them with the opportunity to do what they need to do to learn. That's my little soapbox. It, but about the soapbox, what, what I find is funny is that this is the prescribed technique for teaching the students, but it's not how teachers are taught. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy, guys, isn't the They talk about cognitive overload and all these techniques, but but they don't actually apply that to those who are learning to be teachers. Like, because in Ireland, what they've done now is teacher training is now two years. Oh, like, okay. Isn't it, is in, is in, if you're a primary school teacher, it's it's been always been three years, but yeah. the secondary school teacher, it is now two years because like, Guys, if you saw how much they fit into how little time and how little room there is for synthesis, uh, you would see very quickly why few people keep it up. Yeah. Well, that's it, because it's it's not a year long course. It's a nine month course. September to June is nine months. <laughs> and, and, and you've got to do, like you were saying, you've got to do the increased contact time. On top of that, you've got to get used to the balance between contact time and marking and planning and all of that stuff, because it does take you guys longer than it takes us. And you've got to do the academic part, because as we've said, without the academic part, the, the observation and the, the, the standing in front of the classroom doesn't mean very much, because you, you don't know why you're doing it as much as your kids don't know why they're doing their learning objective. 
and, 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 and you're just perpetuating a culture of non-thinking. Which yes. Is, which is not great. <laughs> no, no. Because if you're just going to stand up and mimic the classroom teacher, because that's who you've been observing, then the kids may as well just have their classroom teacher. It, it just, it, it all becomes kind of clony, really. And, and that is far too much to fit into nine months, particularly for mature students uh, like yourself, who then might also be in a position where they need to have a, some kind of income alongside that. Absolutely. Like, the, the thing about it for me is just because, because, you know, like I, I've had my own like startup company, you know, with investors and this thing and that thing. So I know a little bit about hard work, uh, fortunately, you know, as in I know about doing 16 hour days, seven day weeks, uh, weeks on end, months on end. Um, but I've also learned that I don't want to live like that. Yeah. And, and that's why I see you in the schools. It's too close to that. It's honestly too close to that. And if you're a new teacher, like energy management is one of the biggest things people are getting right. But because I've, you know, fortunately just true, because I'm older and more experienced, I have an ability to juggle many things at once. But if someone was younger, I would just like tell everyone, lads, I'll see you in nine months. Yeah. I will see you in nine months. Um, just to manage your own expectations and to manage expectations for see in nine months like i don't see my friends barely at all right now mm -hmm. they, like barely at all and i am managing my time like really well like but you know i have to look after family i'm do, i'm organizing a wedding this year uh congratulations thank you sir uh, i i'm organizing like international trips like for for you know people running events I'm doing a lot at once and getting the good marks and doing this stuff, but something will fall off guys. Uh, and you know, if you just, it, it, it's better off. And, and, and actually another tip is what, um, if you can, if you can get the bursary, don't dream of doing the, don't dream of doing the, the full, the full time, the salaried one, you know, cause, cause you have more time for reflection. Some mm -hmm. people say that they learn better from being thrown into the deep end, but um, ultimately what's going to provide longevity in your career is reflectivity. Yes. Because we need to course correct. And if you don't have time to reflect on look, why was that a good lesson? Why was that a bad lesson? You're going to have a tough time down the, down the line because, Absolutely. Uh, because, you know, one of our, the program director, and actually he's a great guy is, and he's a PhD himself. And, um, he was saying like some people, like some people like just stop, they stop changing. Like after the first year of teaching, they don't evolve any further. And he said, then some people after five years, they just, they're like, yeah, I've, I've, I've got teaching. Like, <laughs> I, teaching is, um, it's always changing because the children are always changing. Or the yes. students are changing. And because of that, you can never stay still. And that's why, and that's why I've seen that it is a six day a weeker. If yeah. you want to be the guy, if you want to be the man, man or the woman uh in in your field it's it's you gotta be you gotta commit you gotta commit oh do you know what i can think of no better message to uh, to finish our interview on so patrick thank you so so much for joining me this morning i have loved every minute of it <laughs> sorry guys that we went off and managed to <laughs> me and darren get together it's uh <laughs> It can be wild like that. Uh, but it's good though. I mean, for me, this is what Teacher Talk Radio is all about. It's about, it, it's in the name, it's teachers talking. And, you know, it, it's nice for us to understand that we all have, no matter where in the country we are, uh, or in the world we are, no matter what the, the, the privileged status of school we're in, we all have very similar issues. Um, and none of us have got the answers, otherwise the issues wouldn't exist, but we've all got ways to, to try and alleviate it. And, uh, and it's good to share those. All right. Sorry, guys. Final, final, it, it, oh, it's, it. it's collaboration. Guys, yeah. in, teaching is too hard to do on your own. Like Darren, he's been there, he's done it. And, um, thankfully he's, he's, he's a, he's a kind guy and he, he's generous and, and he gave his time because he cares about who's coming up after him. But guys, teaching is too hard. Don't play a lone soldier. Uh, get resources from people. See what other people are doing because it's just too hard. It's too yeah. much. Just to be done. You, yeah. you can't. can't no. Do it. no. Interestingly, do you know what? 
I would normally wait and just say this on air. I think, Patrick, you might be interested in this. I saw something um, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday I, I was doing a course and um, the course leader referenced a study that happened in the US um, at university level. And the it was a maths class and the teacher noticed that the African-American students were not doing as well as the Asian students were. And he started talking around and talking to his colleagues about why that might have been. And the stereotypes came up, you know, about Asian people are just naturally good at maths or, oh, you know, well, maybe um, there wasn't the, the, the best quality teaching at ground level. Um, and he was like, well, no, we're, a, we're a, a prestigious university. All of these people have shown that they can do maths in order to get in. There's something wrong. But when um, when this professor started to examine the learning habits of his students, he found that the Asian students studied together and the African-American students studied separately, individually on their own. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was kind of the conclusion that he came to uh, kind of ties back to, to what I've talked about on the show before about social constructivism. And it's this idea that knowledge is constructed, knowledge is created, knowledge is made, and you can only construct something socially with other people. And, and I think that applies to us as teachers just as much as it does to our kids. So you, you are absolutely right. You know, find your tribe to use that, uh, the upcoming cliche. Um, yeah, it doesn't need to be teachers in your school. You know, we know that teaching social media is full of people. So find the people who are on the same wavelength as you, had the same values that you do, and collaborate with them because that's going to be how you get better. It, it is, guys. And the thing is, are people at the top of the profession are super generous. Like, I, I've uh, I've tried to bring together the, the band of super teachers. <laughs> And there's, there's another two teachers, but because because they're heads of departments, they're so busy we couldn't even get it to, to come off. But but I personally get the benefit from all of them, uh, and and I cross pollinate. <laughs> but there, there are people out there, heads of departments, who just they don't get to talk with this with anyone because they're the top. But they love talking with this because it's their passion. And that's how they got to the top of their department. Once again, my most sincere thanks to Patrick for giving up almost an hour and a half of his time the other day to chat to me. Um, do stay tuned here on Teacher Talk Radio because once again, we have a fantastic lineup of shows for you this weekend and going into next week. Thank you to everybody who has texted in today. As always, I really, really appreciate your input and I am so, so happy to be back. Um, I cannot wait to talk to you all next week. Until that time, have yourselves a great week. Enjoy whatever it is you are doing this weekend, and I will see you for breakfast next Saturday. Thank you and goodbye. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.